Today we are going to be discussing plant-based protein analysis, specifically how nitrogen protein analysis supports research, product development, quality control, and production optimization for the plant-based food industry. Now, why Elementar? Well, the company offers cost-effective and environmentally friendly nitrogen protein analyzers, which provide precise and accurate results, ideal for use along the entire supply chain, from raw ingredients to end products, and we'll be discussing some of those applications shortly. We are very pleased to have Joseph Thomas with us, and he is the president and CEO of Elementar Americas. Joseph, welcome. Really appreciate it, Dink. Wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm so grateful to be here uh, to sh share with you as well. So thank you for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you. Now, before we get into the nuts and bolts, um, could you provide me with some background about Elementar as a company? I believe it's been serving the food and beverage industry for, for many years, more than 100. Yeah, how much time do you have? Uh, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be uh, relatively brief with my response um, itself. But yeah, Elementar's roots kind of trace back roughly 125 years, I would say even 126 years as of this year. So there was a collaboration between uh, Wilhelm Karl Horaeus and a bunch of brilliant um, scientists um, that was focused on analytical technology. Uh, they got together, collaborated, and they produced the first modern elemental analyzer. And if you could guess, back in 1897, uh, which was then mass produced at Horaeus in, um, in Hanau, Germany. Uh, and Hanau, Germany is essentially um, a little town uh, 30 to 45 minutes uh, east of um, Frankfurt, just to give you a little perspective itself. Mm -hmm. And now this formed the basis of the company we know today as Elementar. And then in 1990, Dr. Hans Peter Sieper spun Elementar from the Horace Group into the independent company uh, that we are today. And then in 2017, his son, Albrecht Sieper, uh, took over the management of the company from his dad, from his father. So um, uh, he's essentially uh, continuing the tradition of the uh, owner-managed family company uh, mm -hmm. as well. And so you had to ask me about you know how long we, we've been serving in the food and beverage industry, and we can kind of dissect that in 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 multiple ways. And we could do that from a, a full uh, life cycle perspective to being very targeted in one of the elements that is so important in the food space, which is uh, nitrogen. And so in 1964, the N-Rapid analyzer was introduced. It was the first Dumas uh, N-protein analyzer that was produced by Horaeus. Now, if we fast forward to 1989, the macro N was developed by Foss Horaeus, uh, which took care of samples up to five, um, five grams, I believe. And then in 1991, the rapid N was brought to market, which took care of uh, samples up to, uh, I believe, about one um, milligram. And so please don't get me wrong, during during this time frame, it wasn't just these two analyzers that was brought into market. There was plenty of other elemental analyzers that was brought into market. And I'm strictly speaking about dedicated end protein analyzers now nevertheless between 2006 and 2015 the rapid n cube its successor the rapid n exceed with the amazing es regainer technology and its bigger brother the rapid max and exceed was also uh, brought into market um, mm -hmm. during this time as well so yeah just a well, quick little quick little snippet a quick little history about Elementar. Yeah, well, lots of history there, and presumably the product itself has changed a hell of a lot since 126 years ago. Now, uh, a market that has a lot uh, a shorter history in terms of timescales is the plant-based sector. Um, when did you start working with plant-based food manufacturers? Yeah, we've been uh, we've been supporting the plant-based food manufacturers for for over a decade now. Now, uh, we've been supporting the traditional food manufacturers for significantly much longer the science behind crude protein analysis has not changed for us whatsoever so when it comes to plant-based or alternative based or alternative meats or traditional foods and 
if you're just interested in protein analysis, we've we've got you covered. And so we don't have to bring out new technology in order to support the plant-based food sector, which is which is great because there's such foundational principles that we've been utilizing for for so many years, as you've heard from my little quick little history snippet um, mm-hmm. as well. So yeah. Okay. And I'm, I'm, now I'm interested to see uh, or to hear how you've seen the industry evolve over that time so we're talking what 2013 uh, i guess plant-based foods really took off or started to take off in about 2015 i know they've been around for a lot longer than that but people really yeah. started to start being interested in sort of health and wellness and climate i guess it's around about that time that it started to really accelerate yeah absolutely nick i mean the space um i think it's so evident that the space has been evolving so rapidly that the, the r word just keeps coming to my mind it's just so rapid it's so fast mm-hmm. now plant-based food dollar sales grew 6.6 percent in 2022 do you want to guess what that means from a dollar perspective how much that oh, is oh uh, hundreds of millions <laughs> it's about eight billion dollars wow. <laughs> in 2022 that, that's that's a lot yeah, um, of zeros, my friend, and and roughly sixty yeah. percent of the U.S. household are purchasing plant-based um, food items, and mm-hmm. a whopping eighty percent of that sixty percent is repeat customers. So this sixty percent that's grabbing stuff off the shelf that's plant-based food uh, is saying, "Hey, this is good stuff. We like mm-hmm. it. We want to keep trying it." And so that's that's a, that's a big number. That's also repeat businesses as well. And, and it's essentially everywhere. If you scour um, the aisles of your grocery store, y- y- you can see it. It's so evident. And it's at eye level too, which is at the premium mark of mm. where food should be, especially on the aisles of the grocery store um, mm. itself. So it's it's everywhere. And, and you could see it in creamers. You could see it in eggs. You could see it in protein powders. You could see it in um, uh, ready-to-drink beverages, you could see it in dips, you could see it in spreads. And if you like eating out uh, as well, um, roughly about 48%, 48 to 50% of the U.S. restaurants feature a plant-based food item on their menu, man. And that wasn't the case maybe 15 years ago, you wouldn't mm-hmm. see that kind of stuff on on, on U.S. restaurant uh, food menus. And so if I were to sum up this question, I would say it has grown steadily without decline over mm-hmm. the past decade, for sure. Yeah. So it's, it's moving. It's yeah. moving very well. well. We, we've seen a bit of a blip recently, but um, what industry hasn't, I guess, exactly. the, way the, uh, the way the markets are at the moment. Um, now, just out of interest, what other industries are you serving? Yeah, we serve... Uh, I, you know, we serve roughly about six different vertical markets. We're serving the chemical space. We, of course, we're serving the agriculture space, environmental materials, energy sector, as well as forensics as well. And within these vertical markets as well, we have organic elemental analyzers, nitrogen and protein um, analyzers, which we're going to be talking about heavily here today. TOC analyzers or total organic carbon analyzers, uh, inorganic uh, as well. We also have optical emission spectroscopy. And, you know, one of the cool technologies that, I, that are kind of near and dear to me as well is the isotope ratio mass spec um, lines as well. And so we kind of support these six different vertical markets using these product lines um, mm-hmm. for our customers today. Now, when we uh, launched this magazine, we kind of assumed that we would have processing technologies, ingredients, and the two come together, but you actually scrape beneath the surface, and there's a hell of a lot more goes into the production of these uh, products that we're seeing on our shelves. So as a bit of context, um, I wanted to provide our readers and our listeners with some tangible applications for your products and highlight some of the benefits that should be of importance to them um, as manufacturers in this space. Uh, And I suppose some of the challenges faced by plant-based manufacturers that nitrogen protein analysis can help overcome now off the top of my head i can think of areas such as nutritional labeling um, product quality um, research and so on Um, now as i understand it your products can be used right at the start of the value chain for crop analysis for instance 
Exactly. I think you hit the nail on the head. And I would even go as far as saying, you know, full full cycle production. Uh, we're, we're kind of part of that every step of the way. But you're absolutely right. And you can essentially monitor the protein content of crops um, ultimately to optimize your growing conditions, right? And you could do that right in-house with one of our analyzers. So you don't essentially have to take your samples and send it out to uh, another lab. Um, uh, itself, you could you could you could do it right in house with um, one of our nitrogen protein analyzers. We could even take it a step further that before your seeds are even planted, uh, we can perform soil analysis to essentially maximize the yield of um, your crops as well. And so we know that soil and the foundation or the soil health is the foundation um, of productive, sustainable agriculture as well. So yeah, we're, we're, we can sit right at the beginning of your, um, food production, um, stage. Um, mm -hmm. absolutely. Now we have about 1600, the last time I checked 1600 plant-based manufacturers, um, uh, among our readership worldwide. Now, in what ways can your analyzers help them? Um, those in the plant-based sector with product quality and consistencies, are there, are there any uses for instance, for inbound good inspection? Yeah, I think I, I think when we talk about inbound goods inspection um, and such, I, I think it, my answers were kind of wrapped around in part of your question. I think for any brand, particularly in the food space, high quality and consistency is absolutely key. And particularly for the plant-based food sector, and I don't know if someone's going to Come after, me, come after me for kind of saying this, and I don't know if this is going to be a little controversial, oh, but be careful, you know, be careful. <laughs> we're in a bit of a, a post early adoption stage of the plant based uh, food space, even though you know it's been around for a little over ten years. Um, but I feel like we're we're slightly past the early adoption, maybe right in between, and we're kind of teetering ar uh, around that. But the protein content of incoming crops and goods is essentially critical for any manufacturer out there um, mm -hmm. in the food space, plant-based or traditional, you wanna maximize. And so having incoming crops that is good, like excellent and premium, mm -hmm. um, is critical for maximum output as well and for essentially maintaining product consistency as well. So you need to be able to measure that right before even it gets onto the production line as well. So it's very, very important to know that what you got coming into your warehouse um, is what it says it is, and it's yielding X amount of protein or X amount of whatever values that you're looking for. Those are very, very critical in production phases as well. So and I, guess, I guess in terms of the end product, they need accurate reproducible data. Um, to keep an eye on things like um, changes in processing and how that could impact the, the final product? Yeah, I, I, you know, I would absolutely say, Nick, that I think it's imperative that any production team, I would even go as far as saying it's critical for even the R&D team to have a, a protein analyzer that has the capability of testing high volumes unattended, um, it seems like a very far-fetched idea uh, of, of kind of the plug and play, especially in the analytical uh, technology space, but that's what you want. You want high volume, you want unattended, and you want great and accurate results ultimately at the end of the day. You want your team to have essentially autonomy to test these new experiments, especially in this space it's all about growing and it is growing. You want them to have the ability to test new formulas. And most importantly, you want the team to have the data behind all of these new experiments and these new formulas that will help them optimize essentially the effect of the product. And so mm -hmm. most of all, you want those results fast. And I always like to say there's a lot of power to be had about, um, I'm kind of dating myself. I don't know if you ever remember watching Friends growing oh, up yeah. and um, Ross, and I don't remember who the other character was, but I think it may have been Rachel who was going up the uh, the stairwell uh, trying to move this large couch. And the key critical word that he was using was pivoting. And I think it's so, or pivot, he kept saying pivot, 
pivot yeah. and so forth. I think it's so important for organizations um, to be able to pivot very quickly and you need to have good, accurate results um, mm-hmm. to be able to do that fast um, in this economy to be yeah. successful. Oh, love friends and uh, now I get the, the the pleasure of watching it with my children as well. We love it just <laughs> as much as I do. Now, well, what about in the use of labeling and, and, and regulatory compliance? Uh, uh, do your products come into play there? Absolutely. Um, I, I think we almost kind of have to ask ourselves, why is labeling and regulatory compliance so, so important? And it's important for a variety of reasons. But one of the key things that I think you and I can probably agree on is the safety of consumers at the end of the day. And in 1990, especially in the US, the FDA through the Nutritional or Nutrition Labeling and Education Act mandated that all food companies were required to make detailed, consistent claims about the food uh, that they're producing. And so what am I trying to get at? We're, We're saying the famous black and white labels that are on the back of uh, these products that we're pulling off the shelves um, that that our consumers are reading, um, it's so important. And we're talking about, you know, uh, calories, we're talking about fats, we're talking about cholesterol, we're talking about sodium, we're talking about carbohydrates, we're talking about proteins, we're talking about minerals and vitamins. So food manufacturers essentially have to meet these regulations and you have to be able to support these manufacturers in providing those accurate results that is consistent that is repeatable and so they can obtain all all those protein levels um essentially fast and repeatable through our protein analyzers and you know these companies they want reassurances and they can be rest assured that they're meeting compliance with local labeling laws uh, Mm -hmm. to push out their product to consumers that are desiring them ultimately at the end of the day. And what about production control and upscaling? I'm presuming that inefficiencies in any process can have an impact on the the final protein product or even limit the output in some way. Yeah, I think think the the Japanese word uh, muda uh, keeps coming to my mind, which is uh, relatively translated, and I could be butchering this, uh, it just means waste, um, mm-hmm. ultimately. And I think for any manufacturer, waste um, and inconsistency is is it's the biggest challenge, right? And so waste and inconsistency in production is always the biggest challenge. And one of the solutions around this is to be dynamic, is to be mm-hmm. dynamic in the start, is to be dynamic in the middle, and is to be dynamic towards the end of um, the product stage before it's being deployed out into the field as well. And so you have to have robust technology that's able to provide you that kind of that dynamic experience. And so our protein analyzers offers essentially fast, low cost analysis at high volumes. You gotta be mm-hmm. able to do it quick. You gotta be able to pull that sample off put it into our analyzer so that you can say, hey, this is good to go, or hey, we need to retool, we need to go back ultimately. And so you could essentially, through our analyzers, have um, effective quality control and introduce very quickly optimizations uh, within your production process um, before it even reaches the um, the end stage as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, now, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm presuming other companies out there in the world produce similar technologies. So sell me on some of those key features and benefits of your particular system. Yeah, I, you know, depending on the end protein analyzer that um, that you acquire from us, our instrumentation offers amazing efficiency at uh, low cost per sample. Some of our customers, um, Nick, require you know, kind of unattended operations where they don't want to be in front of their analyzer all day long, right? They want to work on, you know, different projects. They want to run different samples and kind of move on. They don't want to be locked in because of how a technical um, piece of equipment that's in your lab, you don't want to be bogged down bogged down from uh, any, of, uh, any of those parts of stuff. You want to be able to load your samples hit the run button, work on other projects while getting reliable results. I love that 
perhaps maybe you load your samples uh, at the end of the day before you're going home. By the time you come back in the morning, man, you got your results, mm -hmm. right? Everything's happening unattended, 24-7 type uh, mechanics here for us, right? And customers love kind of the versatility in the wide range of samples and weights as well. Uh, if you get an opportunity, Nick, I don't know if you've ever seen the inside of uh, one of our analyzers, but you can tell the amount of investment that we've made into putting our customers first from a perspective of tool-free maintenance. Could you just imagine operating your car and let's say um, you had to go fill up the air in your tires and you needed a little tool to take off uh, at, uh, in terms of your air nozzle and you didn't have that tool available to you, I think you'd be pretty upset. And I think mm -hmm. it'd be pretty frustrating. You'd have a car that's essentially not working because your tires are flat and maybe you went and took it to the gas station where air is available um, and you're not able to use it still because you don't have the right tools. And so it would be very, very rare to be utilizing a screwdriver to run one of our analyzers in case something went down. So we've invested essentially heavily into tool-free maintenance. All of our ball and pan fittings essentially is what I mean. It, it use these clamps that you can remove using your own hands at the end of the day. You don't need a special tool to remove it. You could just use your, your hands to essentially remove it itself and unclamp it. It's again, essentially uh, rare that you would use even a, a regular screwdriver to kind of operate and optimize our instrumentation as well. Our mm -hmm. footprint, if you cared about footprint in your lab, our analyzer is, is small compared to some of the other analyzers that's uh, out there in the, in the market. And so if bench space was a concern, you don't have to worry about that at all. We also perform full combustion and um, analysis on the, on the sample itself. So we're not taking um, an aliquot um, uh, and performing an analysis on that itself. We're doing the analysis on the full combustion uh, of your sample. And last but not least, I would say our instrumentation is very eco-friendly. And I love that it's kind of parallel to the food, um, to the plant-based food sector as well. We're not using harsh and toxic chemicals um, within our consumables to run your analyzer, right? You don't have to be under a hood in order to be effectively utilizing one of our analyzers. You don't have to be masked up. You don't have to wear uh, nitride gloves um, and, and go that far in order to utilize our analyzers. Of course, I'm not saying that you shouldn't be safe within the laboratory of handling chemicals in general at all, but we're not using sulfuric acid uh, acid. Um, in comparison to Keldol analysis that's out there in the market today. So sorry for the long-winded answer. but No, uh, no, no. Well, there's, lo there's, lots, there's lots of little gains there that all mount up to actually um, some very, very uh, um, needed results, I guess, if you're in a busy lab um, developing these products where budgets are often tight as well. So um, now I'm interested, would your products have any applications um, in other proteins, cultivated meats or fermentation enabled proteins for instance or even hybrid products com combining in the future cultivated and plant-based ingredients yeah I, I mean we have really good applications depth so all of uh, all of the things that you've just listed from you know cultivated meats to fermentation en enabled um proteins and uh, flexi products or aka hybrid hybrid products that combine essentially cultivated meats and plant-based um, ingredients, our technology, again, I think I shared this earlier, our technology doesn't have to change in order to support um, any of these um, food sectors um, mm -hmm. at all. So tried and true protein analysis that's used in the traditional space is essentially what's going to be utilized in, in, in some of these sectors that we've just listed. So um, it's kind of the foundational principle behind supporting our customers in the plant-based food sector or the alternative meat space as well. Mm -hmm. So we've got quite a bit of depth in supporting um, these types of customers as well. Yeah. 
But we're going to uh, finish with a couple of um, rap questions that are more more general. We've done the technical stuff. We've got that out of the way. And thank you for making it very digestible for me, even a layman like myself. Now, are there any <laughs> innovations out there in the marketplace that particularly excite you? I presume that you're keeping an eye on the, the entire market as it develops in all of these different areas. I mean, not a day goes past where we don't get some exciting breakthrough sent into us. Um, what excites you out there at the moment in this novel food space? Yeah, this this space, Nick, has been so fascinating. It's been rapidly evolving. And I love that kind of consumers are also driving the demand for the space to grow as well. And and there's there's a major desire coming from consumers as well. And I love all the manufacturers, and I think they're doing a phenomenal job of introducing this into the market as well. But um, while I think of the space, um, you know, one cool thing that really stuck out to me very recently was there's a company out in California, uh, and this is so wild to me, man, uh, but there's a company out in California that's using atmospheric carbon dioxide, oxygen, and hydrogen gas, and they're mm -hmm. using a process called air, air fermentation. It's mm -hmm. wild. They're making food out of air. Yeah, That is mind-boggling to me and uh you know I, I could just see people's face even 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 after even as i'm saying this i'm still very intrigued and wowed by man like we, we live in such a cool world we live in such a cool space and uh we live in such a time where you know these manufacturers are coming out with these new technologies which i think is going to make um, life so good and and, and so much better uh, at mm -hmm. the end of the day. So, yeah, absolutely. That was the uh, topic of our previous edition, the July, August edition. Sure. And, uh, yeah, that companies they're not the only one doing that around the world. There's some fascinating stuff going on. Now, Joseph, th there's a bigger picture here. Um, and, and the picture is that by 2050, we could have somewhere in the region of 10 billion people on the planet. Um, so protein is a big issue. The, the demand for meat is set to increase. And the way we produce meat at the moment is not currently sustainable. Um, how concerned are you about the future? I'm not overly concerned with how, especially after evaluating the past 10 years and how the plant-based food sector has really been driving the protein element of it. Mm -hmm. I'm not as concerned as I would have been maybe 20 years ago, um, mm -hmm. especially uh, 2050 being in, in, in perhaps not too long from now. I'm not overly concerned that much um, anymore. I love what the organizations are doing from a sustainability perspective. I love that they're introducing all of these new technology into space that can essentially sustain life into 2050 and onwards as well. And so I think even, uh, you know, if we're talking about how the space is going to grow you know i said in 2022 we're about eight billion dollars but prior to that in 2018 it was roughly about five billion dollars and every single one of these space is so protein heavy there isn't any plant-based food manufacturers that is going to push into market without addressing protein at all mm -hmm. and so if we've already seen kind of this rapid growth from 5 billion to 8 billion. I can't even imagine what it's going to be like in 2050 in the space with more competition, more technology, more robustness, more traditional elemental analysis taking place on this world to better support life. I'm not sure if I quite answered your question. Hopefully I did. No, I think it's you did. Home. It's a nice positive way to to, to answer that question because uh, I do hear a lot of negativity from some people. So it's nice to have someone who's um, you know positive about the future. And you're right. And, and the products that we are seeing today, um, as I've said time and time again, they are the Nokias of the of the plant-based food industry you wait until we get the iphones i mean they are getting better all the time the taste the texture the you know the mouthfeel sure. the cookability of, i mean I, i'm a cook i like cooking products and um you know it's all just improving all the time so you know you gave me a really good um, roundup there of your opinion uh, on the future of this industry it's been fascinating talking with you joseph Any, anything you want to say to us before we go no i i, I really appreciate all you know all your time i'm i'm truly truly excited to to have Elementor kind of supporting this journey. And I love 
um, you know, part of our vision statement talks about, you know, quality of life. And I think every plant-based food sector and every manufacturer that's coming into this space is ultimately trying to address supporting the quality of life, again, which is synonymous with our with, with our vision statement. And it's just another means for supporting life. And we love being a part of that journey. So Nick, thank you so much for, again, uh, having me, having Elementor kind of share um, uh, some of our story uh, with you and the audience as well. So thank you. It's been a pleasure having you. Thank you. All right.